Welcome back, everybody. It's time for another episode of CRM Radio Today. Taking a look at the latest and greatest in the ever-changing CRM space with the man who's seen it all and is here to tell us all about it, Paul Peterson. Hey, Paul. Hi, Paul. How are you today? You know, we, uh, we're we uh, always wondering where you're at. You're always all over the place here. <laughs> where are well, you at today? I, you know, I, I'm a little bit more scattered. That's the uh, ADHD kicking in. But no, I'm, in <laughs> I'm in a suburb of Chicago overlooking a um, small lake in uh, a rather busy metropolitan area. And how's the, we- day here. how's the weather there today? Weather is spectacular. So sunny, cool. Not too hot, dry. not too humid, not too uh, Chicago in the summer. I can be sweltering sometimes, sir. Yeah, well, and it, it was last week, you know, and uh, Northern Europe right now, uh, 39 centigrade, and yeah. we were at 106 or whatnot. Uh, what, what, the good news is it kept people off the golf course, <laughs> and being an old guy, uh, getting that heat and humidity kind of loosens things up, so I actually... <laughs> You kind of liked weekend. it. <laughs> all right. Well, I just want to make sure you're okay because I checked I in. I am. All right. Well, who'd you bring with you today to uh, discuss the uh, the world of CRM? Well, it, it it's somewhat uh, it, an interesting uh, guy uh, that I've worked with, uh, Rich Richard Ackerman. Rich, welcome. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure yeah, to be here. Yeah, and Rich, Rich and I have known each other. Well, he's been in the business a little bit longer, but a uh, longtime colleague, CRM consultant, and as of uh, and later moved to service management consultant and an advisor, uh, companies like Motorola and uh, and others, a member of the uh, HDI Help Desk Institute. So uh, Rich has a a vast uh, amount of experience. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, maybe what's changed over that time. And then Rich has a new project that uh, we thought we'd spend a little bit of time under our the guise of Goldmine and uh, Avanti supports volunteerism. Rich has done a little bit of volunteerism in a, in a unique way. So, so Rich, you know, when you when we met, you were already well under your way uh, with with consulting. Uh, you've held roles in sales as consultants. Uh, you know what what what's been the trend over that that period of time? What did what did you see CRM do, and what did you see IT management? Uh, how did how do those fields evolve? Because that's where you spent most of your sure. uh, your time. Well, in, in in the CRM field, I would say it's it's really become far more social. And, um, and be able to leverage the CRM tool side from just being a contact manager to being an all around tool that literally you can run your business on and from sales, marketing, um, to tracking to uh, calendaring, all of it in one place. That was one of the things that I really, uh, liked about the gold mine package. And the other thing I liked about it was that it was very easy to use. So I, I would have to say that that's the trend, to be able to have everything literally in one place. And I think that that trend extended into IT service management with having a bunch of disparate programs, uh, you know, one handling the help desk, one handling risk management, uh, IT asset management. Uh, again, having everything in one application uh, a single source of record is was critically important. I think that's the trend today. That's what's the transformation that really uh, has happened over time um, as you take a look at the industry. And Avante's product um, has, has followed along with that trend very, very nicely in taking all of those uh, individual ingredients, if you will, and, and put them in a single application that serves all of those things and, and goes beyond that. I mean, well, so for CIOs at the, at the higher level of companies that you work with, what's, what do you think their biggest challenge is today that you've seen that, that, that they're concerned about? Well, beyond keeping the lights on, uh, I would say that cybersecurity is a, a very critical aspect for them and, and, uh, protecting data. Uh, everything in an organization runs behind and runs about the data that they possess. And the cost from having a breach uh, or losing that type of data are absolutely astronomical. And uh, one of the areas that I had focused on specifically was in healthcare. And the healthcare cost for uh, data breaches uh, of, of private uh, health data is are absolutely compelling. So I think that's that's really one of the the main things that I think that keeps CIOs up at night is is making sure 
uh, like I said, aside from keeping the lights on and the servers running, uh, making sure that their data is protected. I would say the second thing is, is certainly um, making sure that they are stay, staying abreast of, you know, the, the trends that are happening. I mean, things don't move in decades anymore. Things move in microseconds, and you have to be able to adapt to that change uh, as quickly as it's happening. Yeah, speed, the speed of change is certainly uh... – uh, daunting. Uh, well, and and uh, when it came to security, I mean, I started out my computer career hanging tapes. So unless I took the tape out of the building, <laughs> uh, there was no <laughs> there was no breach, right? Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, so that that's kind of old old school. But are there any uh, what's what's been the most interesting aspect of your consulting you know uh, career as you look back? Aside from helping people be more efficient um, at what they do is getting people to kind of break out of their shells. I mean, specifically, I spent a lot of time in the service management area, which is uh, is a more technical name for the help desk. And help desk people traditionally are uh, cloistered in their cubicles, um, answering phones, providing service uh, to people to get them up and running and restoring, you know, their whatever problems that they have. But traditionally, those people, that's, that's what they do. They stay there and helping them to understand that, um, with the speed of change and the rate of change in organizations, uh, you can't just do that anymore. You have to be creative. You have to be able to unleash ideas of how to improve not only what you're doing process wise, but more importantly, making the customer experience uh, much more pleasant and, and getting them res- their issues resolved quickly and more specifically being able to do that on a single call with even without even a transfer to somebody else or an escalation. That's one of the most rewarding things for me is to be able to get people to that level. Um, and that's kind of ties in a little bit to my uh, relationship with HDI in helping those individuals that are part of that organization. I believe there's close to 55,000 people in that organization moving forward with, you know, keeping their, uh, their ideas fresh and uh, keeping the attention going on improving the efficiency of the organization. And again, customer satisfaction is really up there. And, you know, when you and I started uh, ticket, uh, taking was the, the the big aspect of service management. Now, uh, as you pointed out, it's evolved to incorporate uh, network discovery, helping employees, uh, enabling customers having the ability to to sign, a, press a button, and uh, execute a series of tasks to onboard an employee. I remember when I started, it took two weeks for CDW to get the computer to me. It was like, what am I supposed to do for two <laughs> weeks? Um, well, they gave me a bunch of manuals to read, but uh, the the uh, the other uh, you know, aspect is that all the all the self service, right? That, that today you you want to try to to avoid you know actually talking to somebody. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I but I think that Paul, I think that varies too with the individuals. I mean, we what are we servicing now? Uh, five generations, five different uh, uh, levels of customers. Some customers still like to talk to people, and yes, other people would like to click the button. Get the, the, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, a chat line or whether, um, self-service through uh, a database uh, of knowledge base, if you will, to get their answers. So I think there's a, you know, it's kind of a little bit for everybody. So you got to have the, I think the multiple channels available besides just chat room and a, uh, a chat line and uh, a knowledge base. So, but again, I think the key is how quickly can I get you back up to service and running with your Excel program or uh, even just getting email. I mean, uh, even today I have a problem sometimes with my provider where uh, I can get Gmail, but I can't get my uh, Outlook mail and be able to have that all in one place. It's critically important. I can't sit around and wait uh, two days to get resolution and restoration of service. Uh, I could be, my business could go south in that kind of, that period of time. So those are really, really critical things. And, and apart from being a consultant, you were also in sales for a long time. So any, now that you've uh, retired from that, what, any, any takeaway on being a good salesperson? Yeah. And I think ask a lot of questions and make sure and listen carefully talk less, 
you know, no say in spray, if you will. But the other thing I think was really, really critical more towards the end of my uh, time in IT technology is to make sure that you had all the right people in the room. A lot of consultants go out and work with certain groups of people, yet there's other aspects of the organization that should be participating in the lively discussion of how is this going to affect us? What's the change is going to be? What's the change management issues? And that, if there was anything that I could have seen improvement in, in selling is, is people to be able to do that, to be able to make sure they got the right people in the room and being able to ask the appropriate questions and sit back and listen. Strategic selling, making sure you know who the influencers are and uh, their role and, and so forth. Did you have a particular sales methodology that struck you uh, it's one of the questions i ask many of our guests in their in their yeah, histories being the old timer that i am i'm and still to this day i find it apropos with sanders uh, uh the sandler sales method and uh, until i yeah, i've been in sales prior to that until i ended up getting involved in sandler institute i really wasn't seeing any success and then once i understood how to ask the right kind of questions and how to sit back and listen and all the other aspects of, of Dave Sandler's methodology. That was very successful for me. And then, you know, finally moved up and, and got involved in the president's organization for Sandler Institute. I have a lot of friends today, um, that have gone through their careers, uh, as consultants, uh, for the Sandler Institute. It's still preach it. I mean, it, I yeah. think it's still successful. So for for me, the, that aha moment was spin selling, Neil Rackham. Uh, when they they came out with that, I went, oh my gosh, this is the answer. Because previous to that, it was scripts. You know, they, a lot of yeah. sales training was read from the script, repeat the script, just do the script, Paul. And uh, right. I had a boss ask. He said, well, why do you keep talking about labor scheduling? I want you to talk about cash management. And I go, uh, the customer doesn't want to talk about that, boss. So I would get in trouble with my boss, but my customer. You know, love me because I just reorganized the same bit, same bits. Um, so the, the other question that, that we have a little bit more personal insight. Do you have a favorite sales movie? <laughs> Probably the same movie that you have is, you know, Put that coffee down. Coffee is for closers. That's, that's yeah. probably my all time sales. Yeah, I'm Gary Ben Ross and I do like I'm Tommy Gary. Boy. We're not leaving till you say no. Yeah. No. All right then. <laughs> and uh, off they go. I always, uh, I, I love Tommy. I think it was Tommy Boy. I think that was the name of the... Um, Tommy Boy, and you know, and David Spade is coming back on the Comedy Channel with another series that looks very interesting. So I'll have to watch for that. But what was his name the other day? Chris? can't remember the actor's name, but the two of them together were fantastic. I, I, that was a great, that was a great movie. But, you know, I think an influencer for me, though, is the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. I mean, that's... I, I don't think I ever went to an early sales meeting without the manager going through that. Yeah, <laughs> on the, the put, leads, put the way he handles down, them, and they're all wrapped up in a ribbon. And uh, yeah. I remember watching that. I, 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 My wife thought it was a Glenn Close movie. So when we watched it, uh, it was in a birthing room. And she, after she saw the first few minutes, she said, is your office like that? And I said, oh, no, we have much nicer <laughs> furniture. But it was yeah, that, that was my world, too. So I think we're on ready for a break. And then we're going to come back and talk about your new project, Rich. So we're talking with Rich Ackerman, longtime CRM and service management consultant. And we'll be right back after paying some bills. We know you rely on your CRM system, and it's usually a love-hate relationship. Most CRM systems, well, let's face it, they're expensive. They're hard to understand. People don't use them properly. And you're probably paying for features that you don't even want. If that's your case, then maybe it's time to simplify. It's time to get more from your CRM. Why don't you go back to the original? Trust Goldmine. We help pioneer the industry after all. Goldmine CRM is, well, it's simple. It's affordable. And it's proven. If all those sound appealing to you, if you're just tired of the CRM headaches that you're getting from trying to implement something that's just too complicated, too expensive, and too much for you to figure out, then why not go back to the original? Visit Goldmine today, goldmine.com. All right, let's pick things back up with uh, Paul and his uh, fellow Saturday Night Live alumni here. Yeah, and, and <laughs> Paul, our producer, Rich, it's Chris Farley. Thank you. Yeah, right. Uh, the late Chris Farley, and uh, he did the great motivational speech. I live down by a river. Anyway, uh, hilarious, uh, hilarious stuff. So we're talking with Rich Ackerman today, longtime consultant. This is part two 
of our session. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I was asking Rich one day, what do you do after retirement? You know, what do you, what, what do, you do? And uh, you had a big answer. You, you've been a photographer, a musician, and uh, you coincidentally took a trip to Alaska. So tell us how that spurred this new, uh, this new project that you're working on. Yeah, thanks. And, and um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, in my, you know, my initial career, after, literally after leaving our band and, and, uh, in high school is I got into photography. I was uh, just totally intrigued with the, the concept of uh, being able to take a picture, go downstairs and in, in a dark room and, and watch images appear in front of you after developing the film. That to me was just, that was an incredible uh, insight for me for a lot of kind of magical. It was, yeah, it was very magical. And, uh, so I kind of st- got that start there, but even, you know, prior to that, we were talking about Alaska, you know, my father always wanted to take that trip on the Alcan highway up to Alaska, not necessarily knowing where you go after that. I mean, cause the Alcan highway does go so far and then you got to make some, some decisions on, on where you're going to go. And one way you can still travel in a car, in another direction, if you head west or northwest, you better have a float plane or, or uh, a boat because there's really no other way to get around. That always intrigued me. My dad never made it there. Um, I always had thought about it. He talked so much about it. But I also learned, you know, that there are a lot of other people that had that desire. So uh, after I retwi- retired in 2016, I, I literally went back to my photographic roots. That's what I uh uh, initially started out to do and um, started work and set up my own company as a environmental landscape photographer. And uh, most of my work, I have my own website where I sell it, uh, my my uh, work, works of art, if you want to call it that. But mostly are landscape. And the other thing that I do are what's called macro photography. There's a whole other world, um, you know, inside a flower uh, you know, that you might not see or in the ground or whatever. I do a lot of photography work in the Indiana Dunes National Park in bogs and the fens there. And my head is literally, you know, in two inches from, you know, stinky skunk cabbages. And as my wife says that, you know, in sometimes if I don't come home, she'll just come back in, in the spring after the winter and, and the ice thaws and come and pick me up. But that's kind of how I got into it. So Alaska to me, I mean, is, is the state is literally what a half the size of the United, the lower 48. And a lot of it is tundra, very cold wilderness area. But there's a particular area in Alaska that was intriguing to myself and to a number of other people, uh, that had come in contact with, uh, since the 2016 summer season. And it's uh, called the Inside Passage, literally located in the southeast Alaska panhandle area. And it's a series of islands, glaciers, channels, um, and it's a wilderness area. And it, the core of that is the Tongass National Forest. And the Tongass Forest contains some of the oldest trees in history, known to man, thousands of years old. There's a lot of things that are happening with that today, but I wanted to see it. I wanted to see it as I got older and, and before I maybe start forgetting things in my life. I wanted to be able to capture that region uh, on film and to do the photographs uh, so that my children and my grandchildren could see it. And as I thought about it after the first trip that we went, I decided that I think more people really need to see this area other than a travel log. Uh, other than a book of, of color photographs that most people like to, would pick up at the store, at bookstores and see. This is a book reminiscent, uh, that I'm doing of the, the books that were, uh, made about the West in the national park system in the late thirties and forties and fifties. Books like Yosemite and in, in the range of light from Ansel Adams, for example, or California in the West from Edward Weston. These are large coffee table books that so when you open the book, um, you can really get the impact of the area and the landscapes of looking at a glacier that between one year and the next will slide down a mountainside up to a mile because of the temperature, the rate of temperature increase that's happening in our planet right now. And, and Rich, you subtitled the book The Vanishing Wilderness, and uh, you also had two other 
important editorial aspects. I call them editorial a- aspects, but uh, one, you, you filmed much like Ansel Adams, you mentioned, right, in, in black and white primarily, right? And then the second was Correct. that you tried to avoid not only the travel log aspect, but also any of the politics uh, around around the area. So what was your thinking in, as, as you approached, uh, I'll call it the... Um, the arrangement of all the pictures. What was there, what was going through your mind in the story you were trying to, uh, to tell? Yeah, and that's exactly it. I mean, it, it, it's very, very hard to tell this story without talking about climate change because really it's the, the underlying cause of why this area is vanishing. I'm hoping most people understand from basic science classes that, you know, the planet is goes, goes through uh, heating and cooling cycles you know, through eons of time, and you know, every you know, ten, twelve thousand years, the planet gets colder. I mean, we're literally, from a cycling standpoint, we're due for another cooling section cycle. But the problem is that we've interrupted that cycle, you know, with uh, carbon emissions, which we've all heard about day in and day out, um, almost to the point of being ad nauseum. And I, I, I could be called blasphemous for saying that because literally it's reached the tipping point. You know, we were talking earlier on the introduction about how warm it's been here in Chicago. The Juno temperature uh, in Alaska, which is right in the heart of the Inside Passage, I think reached 85 degrees, and it's never, ever been that hot before in, th- in that region. That region is already a temperate climate because of the warm ocean currents from the Pacific Ocean. So in the winter time, you don't really see it get brutally cold like you might see in the Midwest or further north in, in Alaska as you get closer to the Arctic. And um, so climate change does have an effect on it. But I really didn't want to focus on that. There's too many people already doing that. There's a lot of books talking about climate change. I really wanted to show the beauty of this area as it stood in 2017, and then when we went back again in 2018, I could actually show some differences in some of the, the landforms that are there, the landscapes are there. You can literally see it from one year to the next. But the beauty of the area, it, it's just so unique. It's pristine. The ecosystem there from the trees creating the nutrients in the ground that feed the salmon population, which most of us are eat sockeye and different, I don't know, four or five different types of salmon come from that region. I wanted to be able to show that ecosystem and how it works. And I also incorporated uh, the help of uh, of a, a great writer, uh, Brandon Schuler, to be able to align the photographs that I took with the meaning and the historical aspect behind that region. And I think it really, really came together very nicely. Some of the photos that I saw, too, while still photos, captured movement, which was very uh, evocative. And we only have a minute or two left. So, Rich, you chose mm-hmm. a, a unique way to bring this book, publishing Indiegogo.com. And I just wanted you to speak to that a little bit and tell us where we can get the, you know, the name of the book and when it, you think it'll be available. Sure. Great. Yeah, Indiegogo was a, a, a very, very good vehicle. It's not terribly different than Go, uh, a GoFundMe page, except it's for people that have developed a product or a service that they're selling as opposed to a cause. And um, it's a little unique, but it's like anything else in, in social media. You have to be able to understand how to promote it correctly. Otherwise, you're going to be a whisper in a hurricane. I mean, there's so many individuals that have great solutions and products that are on Indiegogo that you have to be able to make a lot of noise to get people to come and take a look at it. It's out there. I've closed the page off for this particular campaign, but you can still see all the aspects and the photographs and my original uh, talk that I did about why we did this book. And I think the last question that you were you were asking is, when can we see it? I'm finishing. The bibliography is finished. We're going through final proofing uh, this week. I did have an interruption, as you know. Uh, my brother passed away uh, a week ago, Friday, and so we kind of put the book on hold for a little bit, And uh, but we're still targeting uh, probably, I'm going to say mid-August realistically. I want to get the book in print before then, and uh, we are planning to do a launch in the Chicagoland area, actually in Naperville, at Anderson's Bookstore. We've been talking with Rich Ackerman, longtime consultant. We learned a little bit about uh, service management and sales and his new book about the Southeast Passage, uh, the Vanishing Wilderness in Alaska, due out in 
approximately August. We wish you luck with that. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And um, given the conditions, Paul, surf is up. You've been listening to another episode of CRM Radio Today. Right here in the Funnel Radio Network for Network listeners like you. 